Welcome, everyone. My name is Dan Tokaji, and I'm the Dean of the University of Wisconsin Law School. On behalf of all of us here, it is my honor and privilege to welcome you to the 2022 Judge Thomas E. Fairchild Lecture. This lectureship series was established many years ago, uh, now over three decades ago in 1988, as a tribute to the great Judge Fairchild. Initiated by his former clerks, the purpose is to bring in a distinguished member of our profession, the legal profession from the bench bar academia, to speak on a contemporary topic of great importance to the profession. And we certainly have that today. Um, before I get to our distinguished speaker for today, however, I want to just say a few things about Judge Fairchild, who had uh, a, a history that is deeply connected with our own history at UW Law School. He was a 1937 graduate of the law school and served as the Wisconsin Attorney General, as U.S. Attorney for the Western District of Wisconsin, as a circuit court judge, a justice of the Wisconsin Supreme Court, and later as Chief Judge of the United States Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit until his death in 2007. Judge Fairchild was renowned for his broad and deep scholarly approach to the law, for his dedication to justice, and for his remarkable sensitivity to everyone in our joint enterprise of searching for equal justice under law and trying to make that a, re a reality. Judge Fairchild's legacy has attracted many distinguished speakers over the years to serve as Fairchild lecturers, including uh, former Supreme Court Justices John Paul Stevens and Sandra Day O'Connor. And uh, it's certainly true that today we have an exceptionally distinguished speaker joining us. Judge Nancy Gertner is a former U.S. District Judge on the United States District Court for the District of Massachusetts. She's currently a professor of practice at Harvard Law School. Um, Judge Gertner is a graduate of Barnard College and the Yale Law School, where she was an editor of the Yale Law Journal. She received a master's in political science from Yale and formerly taught at Yale Law School as well. She was originally appointed to the bench in 1994 by President Bill Clinton and left the bench in 2011 to assume her position at Harvard, where she teaches various subjects, including criminal law, criminal procedure, forensic science, and sentencing. Especially germane to our topic for today, she very recently served on the Presidential Commission on the Supreme Court of the United States, which issued its final report in December of 2021. And shortly after that report, Judge Gertner wrote a terrific op-ed in the Washington Post that I commend to your attention with the great Professor Lawrence Tribe of Harvard stating some additional views on Supreme Court structure and reform. Judge Gertner has received many awards and accolades over the years. I'm not going to even try to name all of them, but they include the Thurgood Marshall Award from the ABA Section of Individual Rights and Responsibilities. Um, she is just the second woman to have received this prestigious award, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg being the first. Judge Gertner is an active scholar, as well as a public advocate, profiled in many different publications. She's written and spoken on a number of issues throughout the United States and indeed the, wor the world. Her book, The Law of Juries, co-authored with attorney Judith Meisner, was published in 1997 and updated in 2010. She's also the uh, author of uh, an autobiography in defense of women, Memoirs of an Unrepentant Advocate, released in 2000. 11. Um, um, I, I, there's a judicial memoir that she has forthcoming about people who Judge Gertner sentenced during her career forthcoming from Beacon Press. Judge Gertner, we are all so honored and delighted to have you here. Today's program will be moderated. Uh, and joining the judge on our virtual stage today is Assistant Professor of Law here at UW Law, Joshua Braver. Uh, Professor Braver's interests lie at the intersection of constitutional law and political theory. They include research on changes in the Supreme Court's size um, that are especially relevant to contemporary controversies over court packing. 
He's got a book coming out entitled We the Mediated People, Populist Constitution Making in Contemporary South America. Uh, his work has been published in many uh, wonderful law journals. Um, and he's also written for more popular outlets such as Politico, Dissent, and Talking Points Memo. Prior to joining our faculty, Josh worked as a civil, civic studies fellow at Tufts University and as a Clemenko fellow at Harvard Law School. Um, so uh, I'm going to turn the stage over to Professor Braver and Judge Gertner in just a second. But before doing that, I uh, need to mention that this program has been approved for one Wisconsin CLE credit. Information on this will be posted and announced at the appropriate time later in the program. For now, please join me in welcoming Judge Nancy Gertner as well as Professor Braver. And you can just all be at home clapping your hands or your virtual hands and we'll imagine the applause ringing through the air as we begin. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, thank you so much, Dan, and, and thank you, Judge Kurtner, for coming and um, and for uh, producing this wonderful report. If you haven't had a chance to see it, um, it really is an extraordinary document um, for for professors, for teachers, and um, for members of the general public. It, it's really unique, um, and I can't recommend it enough. Um, maybe just to get us started, um, Judge Kurtner, can you give us a little background to this report? Um, what what was what prompted the report and, and how did it what was its mission? It, it was um, uh, well first before I start I have to say how how much I wish I could have been here in person. Um, I uh, knew Judge Fairchild. I was a I was a Swigert clerk on the Seventh Circuit in 1971 to 1972, and there was not a more distinguished collegial wonderful place to work. So I wanted to come here because I wanted to, as I said, bond with the former Fairchild clerks and go back to my old haunts. Um, uh, the, the White House Commission report is very, uh, was unusual in the sense that it was certainly a product of the, it certainly was, it was triggered by the questions that had been asked about the Supreme Court uh, to then candidate Biden. But rather than having a discussion about the Supreme Court take place on Twitter, or worse, uh, you know, or even on the floors of the Senate, uh, the idea was to create a dispassionate space where people could talk about the history of the Supreme Court, even talk about comparative Supreme Courts, uh, and and what and give go back and forth about the pros and cons. Um, it was not to be a, a, a commission that would make recommendations. It was set up to be not only just bipartisan, bipartisan doesn't fully convey the, <laughs> the, the, the makeup of this. This was, uh, you know, on the even people who might have been characterized as, you know, democratic appointees were all over the map with respect to uh, uh, the reform of the Supreme Court. So it was really trying to show a range of opinions about uh, the Supreme Court, um, and we were constrained. We were broken up into working groups. It, you, if you could circulate drafts in your working groups, but once you came together, uh, once those drafts became part of a single document, everything had to be public. Uh, we had multiple public hearings, multiple testimony. I mean, it was as careful. Uh, and deliberative an analysis of a very complicated topic that there could be. And I was happy to be a part of it. Yes, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful document and it's, it's incredible. It really gives you a layout of all the different perspectives. But of course you have your own unique perspective that um, partly made it into the report and is definitely in your op-ed. And um, one of the things that you've come out in favor for is, um, uh, in favor of expanding the size of the court, what some people call court packing. Can you explain why you're in favor of it? I, I have to explain it by way of an evolution. So I was actually, uh, I joined this, this commission without any having a position on, on uh, anything except perhaps the need for uh, ethical rules, uh, enforceable ethical code for the court, a code like the code I was operating under when I was on the court, when I was on the district court. Um, uh, but as I listened to the arguments and saw the, the, the involving product and watched the current Supreme Court 
um, I changed my mind. Uh, so to some degree, this was a deliberative process that actually affected me. I was not in the minority. There were numbers of, there were about five or six of us, Larry Tribe, Cheryl and Eiffel of the NAACP, Walter Dellinger, and a number of us came to this position um, uh, really slowly and carefully. Why did we, we didn't call it court packing. <laughs> um, the, the, the idea here was um, that this really was a unique moment. And in that respect, unlike other moments at which expansion of the court was addressed, um, that yes, there was a concern that at least two members of the court, uh, Gorsuch and Amy Coney Barrett had, uh, had gotten uh, to their positions on, on the bench, uh, on the high court through means that were, you know, out of touch with the usual norms. Um, uh, with respect to Judge Justice Gorsuch, uh, it, he, it followed the 11 month hiatus during which under the Obama administration, when Leader McConnell had refused to even hold a hearing about the, the, the nominee of Obama, namely um, Merrick Garland. Um, it followed from the rush, really the unseemly rush to put uh, Amy Coney Barrett on the court, uh, you know, what was it, less than a week she was nominated, less than a week after Justice Ginsburg died, while people were in fact doing early voting, and only, what was it, a month and a half before uh, the, the 2020 election. So whatever the norms were that defined why uh, Schumer, why uh, McConnell had held up the Garland nomination were suddenly not there for the Amy Coney Barrett uh, nomination. And yes, there was a sense that this was a court that had been packed. I might add that the, the, there had been article after article about a very unique route to the court, which was a, a route that went almost exclusively through the Federalist Society. President Trump and his team were very clear that uh, that was going to be the route and they were going to take those recommendations. So one was the concern that the court uh, was being packed in a way that it had never before uh, been packed. Uh, the second was the concern that, that um, this court and other judges around the country were also enabling uh, anti-democratic moves across the country, uh, the cutting back on the Voting Rights Act, uh, refusing to come to grips with gerrymandering, uh, uh, approving uh, voter suppression um, and efforts to really limit minority voting in particular, um, uh, so that it was one, the way the court had been created. Then there was essentially a move afoot by a court enabling um, and stymieing democratic change. And, and finally, this was a court that was not just, I disagree with this or that decision. This was and is a court that was um, held bent on changing the law on numbers of fronts. Uh, there was a, really at breakneck speed, no respect for precedent, no respect for even the usual institutional norms, the cases you take on appeal, the shadow docket, um, there's a wonderful comment uh, by uh, Robert Dahl from 1957 that said, policy views dominant in the court are never too long out of line with the policy views dominant among majorities. In other words, that essentially the court, although it doesn't map on to the electoral process, invariably the ebbs and flows with the elections, that it's not too long when it's out of sync with democratic majorities. The combination of the, of the factors that I described, a packed court uh, moving to enable uh, uh, voter suppression, uh, coupled with uh, a, a breakneck speed at which they were doing it, suggested to us that this was, as we began to believe, a, breakneck, a, a break the glass moment, that this was a, a moment like any other. This court was really baked in for generations. And, and that was what was 
and something had to change. So it, it we struggled for a long time. I mean, I, I, I didn't want to be the say, well, I don't like their likely decision on abortion. And it really was not that. Um, it really was a combination of the factors that I'm describing, which is whatever disagreement I may have with what they were doing now, the fact of the matter is that these factors made it unlikely. This was not a court that was going to change in the foreseeable future and for generations. So I changed. This really was a break the glass moment for me. And uh, of all the changes that we were thinking about, expanding the court is actually one that can be done by legislation. Wonderful. Um, that's so, so fascinating about what a unique moment this was, the unique combination of factors that came together. One of the things I, I do as a law professor is ask annoying hypotheticals to kind of test our intuitions and, and think through. Um, and unlike your students, I don't have to answer. That, that is true. That is true. You can feel free to decline. Um, right. So, but I guess the, the questions I want to ask are about trying to understand how much weight these three different factors had. So for example, one of the factors you brought up was that it's a packed court already, that the <clears throat> uh, Gorsuch and Barrett were appointed in a way that was irregular. Um, if circumstances had been different, if in fact um, Merrick Garland had been appointed to the bench, um, and if we still somehow ended up with a, a conservative court that was making anti-democratic decisions, um, that was uh, you know, you making decisions through the shadow docket, um, would you still, you think, be in favor of court packing? No, actually, I don't think I would have been. I, I don't think I would have been. You know, it, um, uh, this is a secret to the people watching. Josh had shared his, his uh, questions with me in advance. And that was when I spent a long time thinking about, it. sometimes it happens that there's a historical moment that reveals the flaws in our institutions. We have seen this with respect to the discussions about change about the electoral laws. We never saw anyone before talk about proposing a phony slate of electors rather than the elected ones by the public. And it turns out that's not so difficult to do under the existing laws. So sometimes there is a historical moment that, just, uh, that exposes the, the flaws in our institutions. This was one such moment. In fact, McConnell has now said that if the Republicans take over the Senate in 2022, that he will sit on any, any vacancy that comes up and not hold a hearing on any vacancy. And if the Senate remains in Republican hands, he will do that, uh, you know, until there's a new president. That's really not the way the system was supposed to work. And so your hypothetical I would have been unhappy with that kind of a change, but there would not be the kind of sense that that change would be baked in for generations to come. In other words, I then would have relied on the Robert Dahl quote that there will be, yes, I'll be happy with the court sometimes, sometimes I will not, but that over time, the usual sort of ebb and flow of the political process uh, would change the court. That's not the case now. I see. So it's really, it's really a unique moment. That that brings us to a, a different moment, um, the moment where uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt um, tried to pack the court. He also had his own um, justifications. Or um, and I'm wondering, um, how do you think this moment is different or similar to Roosevelt's attempt, an attempt that ultimately um, didn't succeed, at least in the sense that he did not increase the size of the Supreme Court. We, we talked a lot about that. That was the historical uh, analogy that everyone was grappling with. And first of all, uh, Roosevelt proposed uh, court expansion after the Department of Justice had actually done a study and came out with a report that suggested expansion. So um, it, this was not, a, you know, a seat of the pants uh, uh, legislative proposal. There had actually been some deliberation on it. Um, and, and actually the issue of expanding the court has come up multiple times over our history. Um, he was responding to, I don't like the decisions they're making. Um, I, as I said, I'm not responding to, I don't like the decisions they're making, even though I don't like the decisions they're making. I really am responding to a structural problem here. And the structural problem is a court 
that will not change because of these factors for the foreseeable future. And you know, people talk about the Supreme Court and the, the, the counter-majoritarian difficulty of the Supreme Court. Um, this, is, this is really quite different than uh, before. I also, I, I didn't mention this in my opening comments, that I ha watching this court is unbelievably troubling. Um, when you have, you know, as I, I was a district court judge for 17 years, and one of the things that happens when you're, when you go from being a lawyer to being a judge, is you know that you have to take into account the Court of Appeals above you, you want to take into account even laterally what other judges on your court are thinking. This is a court that doesn't have to take into account any other viewpoints other than the viewpoints of five and maybe six if you count Justice Roberts. They can talk to each other. Only four need to determine what of the myriad cases comes up to the Supreme Court, which cases they will take. Um, and you add to that, that, that mix the fact that at least four believe really that they have a right to overturn precedent um, that with which they disagree. In fact, the early decisions of the, of the new, of the new uh, Trump appointees in early in, in the uh, beginning of 2016 and 2017 were cases that nobody even heard of uh, in which the court was overturning precedent, cases involving agency fees for unions, um, uh, you know, cases involving property rights. It got to the point that there were dissents from Breyer and Kagan in particular saying, what precedent will you overturn next? And then the next opinion said, we didn't have to wait very long. So th this is a court that can fundamentally change major areas of American law and, and worse, seem hell bent on doing it now. I just finished a book on um, uh, Justice Ginsburg, her representative opinions. Um, and uh, one of the things about Justice Ginsburg is that she was described as a judicial restraint liberal. She believed in precedent. She believed that the court should move slowly um, uh, and incrementally. She actually disagreed with Roe v. Wade uh, because she thought it was too precipitous and that it would have been better to have evolved over the years. Uh, so we've never seen a court with this much power really hell bent on changing everything. And that's different. You brought up Justice Ginsburg's um, ambivalence about Roe v. Wade, that she felt that the court got too far ahead of, of public opinion that she wasn't in line with Robert Dahl's quote that eventually public opinion and the court need to match. Um, are there other examples or, or is abortion one example where you feel like the Supreme Court has gotten too far ahead of public opinion and, and hurt a cause that the justices may have been sympathetic to or may have got may have progressed faster if the justices had held back? I, I can't, I really can't think of one. I mean, I think we'll be talking about Roe v. Wade and Casey in particular, the Casey decision for years. I can't think of any. When you think about it, Brown versus Board of Education was decided in 1954, and the court said, I'm going to implement it with all deliberate speed. Only a lawyer could say all deliberate speed. What the hell does that mean, right? I mean, it means slowly. Uh, the affirmative action decisions of the court, uh, the Bakke decision says, well, you know, we could imagine affirmative action, but you'll, we're going to have to look at these cases carefully, um, we're going to have to weigh and balance, and then over the next, what, 20 or 30 years, they were weighing and balancing, this is okay, this was not. Abortion really was different. Um, and I, I might add, uh, Ginsburg ultimately, I mean, as I do, believed that the right to choose was part and parcel of the right to be free of discrimination, that it really was part of an analysis of, uh, you know, if a woman can't choose when to be a mother and if to be a mother, uh, all of the other protections really don't mean very much. Uh, she was just talking about the way it was uh, decided. So th 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 that's, what, that's what distinguishes this time from any other. Um, 
You mentioned that the court is uh, overturning precedent at a breakneck speed. You know, of course, lower court judges um, are bound by the Supreme Court. Uh, district court judges are bound by circuit courts, but the Supreme Court judges, the apex of the system, um, is kind of in a unique position when it's deciding whether and how to overturn a precedent. Um, can you speak to us a little bit about your opinion about what it is the court is doing that's um, not appropriate in the way it's overturning precedent? Is it just the fact that it's doing it through irregular means like the shadow docket? Or even if the decisions were gone through normal channels, are the court's decisions on um, something like abortion that might be coming up, would those still be illegitimate because they're overturning precedent? Well, I, I understand that the precedent evolves. Um, I understand that we don't want to wed, be wedded to, uh, I mean, after all, you know, um, uh, the, um, the slavery decisions, the desegregation decisions were, were decisions that we decided made no sense um, and were offensive and in fact inconsistent with new understandings of the constitutional guarantees. So obviously precedent is not written in stone. Uh, the question, the debate that's going on between the justices is, is a simple disagreement all you need? I mean, I didn't agree with this, I'm an act, I'm a law professor, and therefore now that I have, now that I can, I will overturn the precedent? Or is it, or does it matter, as in the case of Roe v. Wade and the Casey decision, that decades have passed, that reliance has been had with these decisions, and that therefore in order to undo this takes more than just, I never liked these decisions. And there's a flavor uh, uh, with respect to, to that, the affirmative action, uh, decision, which I think is coming down the pike, is in the same category that it is, uh, you know, the, the, the numbers of justices and courts uh, and Supreme Court panels, Supreme Courts rather, have affirmed these decisions. And uh, uh, you may disagree, but a mere disagreement can't be enough. Otherwise, we don't have a judicial institution anymore uh, because a change in the makeup will mean a total 180 on all of this precedent. So I understand the issue about precedent. The other thing we talked about the lower courts, by the way, the lower courts, this has had a really not a salutary effect on the lower courts, this court, this 6-3 majority. Uh, there was a decision that just came down, I believe it was in Texas, but I may be wrong, of a district court judge who concluded that there was no right of action under the Voting Rights Act based on a concurrence of Justice Gorsuch. That is extraordinary. The case law was overwhelmingly in the other direction. In fact, there was not an issue with respect to that. And this district court judge thought, saw where the wind was going essentially. And then in his case, overturned what was, you know, years and years of precedent. So yes, the Supreme Court has a right to reevaluate. The question is what the threshold for that reevaluation uh, should be. And in reevaluating precedent, you have to take into account uh, it, it's the length of time that, that people have relied on it. You have to take into account profound divisions in the in the legal academy and in the, you know, in the legal academy about the legitimacy of the precedent. So just because you're on one side of that divide doesn't mean you have a right to pull the plug, which is of course what Ginsburg believes and Breyer believed and, and Kennedy believed. Um, I wanna return for just uh, one minute to court packing, um, uh, which is partly in response to, though not solely in response to issues of overturning precedent. You know, uh, we, we joked about hypotheticals, uh, especially annoying kind of law professor hypotheticals, but um, perhaps the most common worry, the most common hypothetical in response to those who advocate for court packing is that there's a danger for tit for tat. You know, um, you may say this moment is unique um, and that's what justifies court packing. But if, if people take your advice, if Congress takes your advice, may expand the size of the Supreme Court when Republicans have control of unified government, that will respond in kind, and any time that you're able to expand the court, it will just go back and forth, back and forth, exploding the court's size over time. How do you respond to that, that danger? 
I felt that danger very much. And I was, that was the reason why I felt as I did at the beginning of this process, this White House commission process. Um, but I felt differently all along. For, for one thing, by the way, we are the smallest, one of, among the smallest courts in uh, high courts. Uh, most courts are in fact, more than nine members, 11, 12, 15, as much as 15. Um, so, I mean, it, it's, not an, it's not an unusual discussion. But as far as the tit for debt, I have, I think this is a quote from the decision, from the commission report, a future Senate majority would refuse to take up any nominations at any times while they held the majority. Well, Josh, that's happening now. In other words, this is the uniqueness of this moment. Yet in an, in an ordinary world, you'd say, uh, uh, if the Senate changes hands, uh, the new majority will nevertheless give deference and consider the president's appointees. Do you have a party that's saying, if we hold the Senate, we're not gonna consider any of the new president's nominees. The system is, as many say, broken. So this is a moment, it seems to me, for change. And the other thing is the relationship between the court and the electoral changes that are being proposed. Um, that's a, saying it's a it's a it's a uh, you know reciprocal process here. Um, the this court is prepared to enable anti-democratic legislation uh, all across the country, um, either a hands-off approach or you know. De defanging the Voting Rights Act, prepared to take steps that will change the electoral process. So maybe there is a risk of a tit for tat in the future. I'm not convinced that we don't have that risk now. Um, and I'm persuaded that that we, we have to take steps. I should say, apropos of your first uh, question, because of the way the commission operated, when we put our working group sections together, that was a point when there should be, when, when all of a sudden it was a single report and it had to be released to the public. And I read the report and I stepped back and said, do you know what this report says? It says, this is a deeply flawed institution in all sorts of respects. We haven't talked about the no enforceable code of ethics, shadow docket, um, confirmation process. This is a court that's deeply flawed. And the upshot of that report would have been nothing we can do about it. And that's a very troubling message that I was unwilling to sign on to. A skeptic might say, yes, I, I recognize some of these problems with the court, but isn't the Supreme Court always a political institution? I mean, is it really the case that by virtue of legal training, um, by virtue of the fact that students took my class or, or, um, or uh, any, anybody's class in a law school, that they have some kind of right answer to questions like abortion, when the right to life begins, whether affirmative action is a form of discrimination. So I guess, I guess my question is, isn't the Supreme Court always a political institution at least, or if not more so than a legal one? Well, I'm not sure I understand the difference between political and legal, I might add. Um, that's, this is my master's in political science speaking. Um, it is a political institution in the sense, should be a political institution, must be a political institution with a small p. That is to say, the position of the judges don't necessarily map onto the, you know, the Republican campaign proposal or the Democratic, shouldn't map onto the Democratic one either. That, that judges come to the bench with a particular approach to, the, to judging, that they get selected uh, in, in part because of that, sure, that happens. But that small p is tempered by the norms of the institution, tempered by precedent, tempered by your colleagues, tempered by the sense of the institution as, a, as one of you know, three uh, with very little power, in fact. Power, a lot of power in some respects to say what the law is, but not to enforce it. Um, so it, it doesn't, it's not a one-to-one -one correlation between judicial philosophies and partisan politics. Now, in one of my op-eds, I said exactly the opposite thing about uh -huh. Justice Barrett, I know, um, uh, because in my view, 
um, uh, the ways in which Justice Barrett in particular and Justice Kavanaugh and Justice Gorsuch were selected, that, which is to say, because they were recommended by the Federalist Society, that to some, it, and they are acting in a way that reflects that recommendation, that in their cases, there may be a much more direct correlation between politics and their judicial philosophies. Um, it's very hard not to watch this court and believe that with a shadow docket, the cases that they are deciding this very peremptory way that really enables a conservative um, uh, Republican agenda, um, the way the cases that they're taking, there are rules for the cases that go up to the Supreme Court, not rules, policies, standards that have to do with, uh, you know, if there's a division in the circuits or a matter of public importance, and they have been granting certain cases that never, as to which there is no controversy. They just disagree. So in, in their case, I would say politics looks different than, than it has been before. Roe v. Wade was the product of, what was it, how many Republican appointees had been uh, in the majority in Roe v. Wade? Um, you know, Blackman was a Republican appointee. Um, so they were roughly aligned with the president that appointed them. This is a one-to-one -one correlation that is very different. I, I want to leave time for questions. So I'll, I'll wrap up with this, this last one. Um, you've spoken about <clears throat> proper judgment, about politics being tempered by precedent and deliberation. I'm curious, in your, your career as a judge, is there, was there a particular decision that was very difficult for you or maybe that you look back on and have mixed feelings about? Um, anything pop to mind? I was always right. <laughs> the Court of Appeals was always wrong. No, I, I um, in the book that I'm writing now, I am taking another look at the sentences I meted out while I was on the bench. For the first part of my judicial career, I was um, under the uh, under a mandatory guideline and mandatory minimum regime. But nevertheless, I believed that there was uh, matters of interpretation, even with mandatory guidelines that I should that I could that I could look at. Um, I wished I had done more there the, the I'm looking at the cases I decided as a judge and what I knew and what I thought was right and what I had to do. And now I've opened up the equation more. I'm actually interviewing some of the men that I sentenced and, um, and learning about things that I didn't know. So I can't say that I'm learning new facts that weren't raised to me. I can't say that I should have decided differently because I didn't know that. But I'm stepping one, taking one step back and saying, we all should have looked at them differently than we, than we did. Um, and, and in re-examining, I wish there's, I, I had done more, there's no question about it. Um, the sentencing was the, and criminal justice issues were clearly the issues that I ha am the most troubled uh, by. Um, but, you know, we, uh, I dealt with discrimination cases that I, 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 um, I was oftentimes, I would often tell you, as you can see the difference between a district court judge and a Supreme Court judge. I like to describe to my clerks what I came to believe was an oi footnote. Okay, this is a bit of, this may be a Northeast, I mean, oi, if you don't understand what oi is. So sometimes I would have a decision that would say, the law requires me to do X and I will do X. And then there'd be a footnote that would go, oi, is this ridiculous? And it was, because um, I understood my lane. And, uh, but, I, but I wanted to make it clear that uh, I didn't think that it was right. Um, and I wanted to start a discussion. So I was doing that while I was a judge. Now I'm looking at it really after the fact to see what else I could have or should have done. And it's a difficult, the book is gonna be called Incomplete Sentences. Well, it sounds like a wonderful, a wonderful project. I, I look forward to reading it when it, when it comes out. Um, it's, very brave and, and honorable for you to go back and kind of take a hard look at your past decisions and um, and to wrestle with these questions about um, how to deal with the current Supreme Court and, and what path goes forward. 
I think I'm, I'm at this point going to turn it out over to Dean Dan Tokaji. Um, we'll take questions from the audience. Wonderful. Thank you, Professor Braver. And thank you so much, Judge Gertner. Um, we've got a number of questions in the queue. If you want to add some, you can go down to the Q&A link at the bottom. Um, so um, let me pair a couple of questions together from two different viewers, listeners. Uh, first, in your view, at what specific point before a presidential election should the Senate no longer consider the president's Supreme Court nominees, a month, six months, a year? Should the same time limitation apply to all judicial nominees or over only Supreme Court nominees? And then a second related question, what about simply changing the appointment procedure, such as requiring action or disallowing action on nominations within defined time periods before an election to prevent antics such as those of Senator McConnell? Well, I, I, don't, I don't have a sense of a specific time. I think we should study that. We should think about that. Um, certainly, Barrett was while people were voting. Certainly, that was too far. Uh, that was different. Um, I do think that we should talk about how uh, changing, making mandatory the holding of a hearing. Uh, you know, the hearing, the, the Merrick Garland nomination was is particularly troubling because Garland, as we now know, and as we knew then, was very much of a moderate choice. And I know, and, and President Obama was saying by that appointment, I understand we're in a polarized country and I'm gonna propose someone who will be in the middle. And surely that would make a difference. Um, the fact that that wasn't sufficient is extraordinary. But I do think, I think we should think about um, uh, maybe a rule requiring a hearing uh, in, the, in the Senate. Uh, Maybe a rule saying at least you can't confirm anyone while people are voting. And then we should think about, talk about other kinds of limitations. I, I don't know where I land on where those limitations are, but certainly when voting has begun, there's something troubling uh, about, and certainly a Supreme Court nomination is something troubling about that. Okay. Um, let me ask a related question here, another related question. Do you agree that there is historic precedent, and I presume that the, um, the question means before the Obama administration, as you just mentioned, in the United States Senate where a president's judicial nominee was not voted upon when a presidential election was looming? I, I mean, Josh, you might know, I can't think of another uh, um, situation in which there was not even a vote. Uh, can, you know, I, I can't think of another situation, at least, at least in modern memory, when there wasn't even a vote. A there's, a a, there's a complicated story about Earl, Earl Warren and when he retires, um, and it would take, would take another, another lecture to, to go into it. But there, you know, there are lots of reasons to distinguish that. And it's, it's an interesting thing to look into further for the person who asked the question, um, but it's complicated. Great. Um, another one that's related to the process of, of uh, judicial nominations and confirmations, to what extent are the problems you're discussing problems with Congress rather than with the court? That is, to what extent might congressional reform rather than court reform be necessary to remedy some of these problems? Well, the problem is that congressional reform going forward will not make a difference to this, quote, break the glass moment. And it is for the reasons I'm describing. As long as we have this court as currently constituted, um, uh, you know, anti-democratic measures being ratified by this court as currently, as currently constituted, Congress can make changes in the confirmation process, but given the age of the court, the people on the court, it will not make a difference. So unless you expand the court, the, the White House Commission also dealt with term limits, which again, every other country has. Uh, every other country has either a term of 18 years or a mandatory retirement. 
uh, I believe the report makes it clear we couldn't find a single country that had an unlimited term. Um, uh, I mean, those kinds of reforms are important. That requires a constitutional amendment. Although there was some controversy about that, but it's fairly clear that it requires a, a constitutional amendment, particularly since when the court was initially constituted and up until someone said 1960, life you meant, you know, maybe 20 years. Now you have people on for multiple decades. Um, so Congress can make that, it, it, unless Congress makes changes in the term limit or the size of the court, um, you know, it, it will not matter for generations and generations. That's my point. Um, this is one regarding the mechanics of expanding the court. Is your recommendation regarding expansion of the court, A, for a larger single panel of justices to consider every case as is current practice, or B, for an expanded roster of justices from which a smaller panel, say five or seven justices, would be selected randomly to consider each respective case? The, the commission um, uh, considered both. I mean, a cons an expansion to what is really the normal number for most courts, let's say 11, um, uh, you know, could then uh, function as a deliberative body, as a single del deliberative body. Uh, to go to panels, there are some scholars who thought that the constitutional reference to one Supreme Court made that mm -hmm. impossible. There was a division on that subject. Um, but, uh, I mean, a, a panel, if, if we can get past, well, even if we propose a constitutional amendment if people thought that was necessary, a panel set situation would be interesting where you'd have a panel and then an en banc uh, alternative to go to the larger court. So, um, and then the question is how you expand. Do you do, one proposal was uh, the, uh, to replace anyone over the age of 70, uh, uh, two per given presidential term, two in the next presidential term, uh, to do it in a, in a way that would keep the gamesmanship that you see now, where people you know, there's no question that Justice Kennedy retired when he did so that President Trump would have a nomination. Um, uh, so if you did it in a structured way, no one would have to pretend uh, that that's going on. I mean, I think, you know, the, these are very important questions. The takeaway is there, this is a very, very, very powerful court in terms of announcing what the law is and a very difficult to amend constitution. So we should care about he how people get to that court uh, and we should care about these kinds of issues uh, because we are unique in the world with a court this powerful, a constitution this difficult to amend and now a court that is baked in for generations to come. Um, so uh, we've got a bunch of questions that have to do with with the proposal uh, of yourself and, and of the commission. And then we've got some other questions on other topics. So I'm gonna to try to tackle the ones that have to do with the commission and your proposals, and then maybe move a little bit more broadly. Uh, here's a skeptical question on the suggestion to expand the court. There have been nine Supreme Court justices, the reader, rights for the last 150 years. There has been one recent occasion when a nominee hasn't been given a vote. Given the unpredictable consequences of your court packing recommendation, don't you think that more evidence of faults in the nomination process is needed, perhaps from both sides of the political spectrum? More evidence of what? I didn't get your... Of, I, I think of, of uh, more evidence of problems than what we have now and of that the current system isn't working is what I understand the reason. Well, right, the, uh, if, if I'm correct, and this is a moment of, that is unique, uh, um, then the fact that there's no precedent for it is not a surprise, that's sort of a tautology. Um, and I think that, that, that this moment is unique. Uh, the combination of the Gorsuch uh, nomination, the Barrett nomination. Uh, I think we'll find more about even the Kavanaugh nomination, I might add. Um, uh, that coupled with um, 
uh, you know, one party hell bent on restricting voting going forward. Um, and as I said, a court that is also uh, determined to undo precedent. I don't think that there are historical analogs for this. Yeah. If you're looking only at the question of whether a, a president, you know, the, whether the Senate sat on a nominee or divided over a nominee, yes, there'll be lots of precedent for that. But the unique combination of the circumstances I'm describing, uh, it seems to me makes this moment different. Um, so uh, this is a question on how practically this might be accomplished. Wouldn't expanding the size of the Supreme Court require ending the filibuster at the current time? And isn't this more extreme than the timing issues in the Gorsuch, Barrett, and let me add Garland nominations? Yes and yes. <laughs> um, uh, yes, I mean, that it will be, I mean, I think it, it you know, it's important as, a, as um, institutional thinkers to make sure that you think about what ought to happen as the first question. And then the second question is the how. And I recognize that the how is difficult. That the, yes, I understand that getting there will be difficult, but that we should think about it, that we should talk about it uh, is another, is a, is a different issue. Yes, it would take, uh, yes, it can't be done by a majority. Yes, you'd have to change the filibuster. Yes, that has other uh, implications. But it's sort of something that I'm grappling with it in my book. It's so important not to immunize the present from criticism because you worry about what's going to happen tomorrow. We have to, you have to come to grips with, if the institution is flawed, you have to say so. And then you talk about the strategies for change. But those are two separate uh, discussions and important discussions. So I'm going to, uh, again, go to ask two related questions. Uh, I'm going to guess I know what the answer to the first one is, but then it leads into a second. Uh, would you have supported expanding the court no matter the party of the president who would be given the power to appoint additional nominees? And second, isn't there a real risk that if court expansion were approved, it would occur under a Republican Senate and make circumstances even worse? There's no question. I, I mean, we, we, I did, Professor Tribe and I dealt with this in our op-ed. Um, there's no question that, let's say the, the court was expanded to 11 during the Biden presidency. Assume that were to happen. It's entirely possible uh, that, the, uh, uh, that those vacancies would be filled by people with whom I disagree. <laughs> I mean, uh, in other words, we're making an institutional suggestion. The content of that change may well, uh, you know, not be to my liking or to other people's liking, but the institutional, we have to shake the tree in some ways because otherwise this is a tree that's gonna ossify and, and resist change. So yes, if Biden now had two appointees, there could be a possibility that a, a Republican Senate would block them. Then there'd be another two appointees or maybe four in the next administration. And yes, it's possible that the Republicans, if a Republican president comes in, that that could lead to a worse court. All I know is that um, uh, doing nothing is not an option, uh, is really not an option. Um, uh, because I do off ads, my husband's always yelling at me that, you know, now that I can speak, I can't seem to shut up. Um, <laughs> Only a husband can say that. I write op-eds and the, I look at what the Supreme Court is doing. And there really is an incredible hubris to this court. I will make this decision because I can. Whether or not it matches what the, you know, the majority of the public believes or whether or not it's consistent with, you know, the legal consensus in the academy doesn't, I can. That's not the way judges. Um, should operate. By the way, that is no way more clear, I should have added this before, than the discussion about um, uh, the, no, the ethical constraints on Supreme Court judges, the absence of ethical constraints on Supreme Court, the absence of enforceable ethical rules for Supreme Court judges. It's, it, there's really this incredible sense of um, impunity and, and it's clear who I'm 
talking about. Uh, I'm talking about Justice Thomas and Ginny Thomas, this incredible sense of impunity. I spent 17 years married to a man. We were married for much longer. But while I was on the bench, I, I, I continued to be married to the legal director of the American Civil Liberties Union of Massachusetts. We took pains to make sure that the ACLU was nowhere near any case of, of mine. Um, we took pains to make sure that we didn't talk about any case until after I had decided it. There were some un uncomfortable rides home when I'd be driving and my husband would say to me, did you just dismiss this police uh, you know, abuse case? And I would go, yes, I did. Or the, the, um, um, the lawyer who filed a motion to disqualify me because of the position my husband had taken. And so I have written a decision which says, if you think I listened to that man ever, you're wrong. We, we were struggling with those issues. The fact that this is a court that is not, and there's a judge justice that is not really speaks to the uniqueness of this moment. So I'll, I'll take my chances that a court that is the product of uh, uh, court expansion will be not of my liking if there's at least change in the future, the kind of change that the Robert Dahl uh, quote was suggesting. There'll be at least ebbs and flows in the future as opposed to a court that is really uh, uh, ossified. Yeah, uh, it's it's uh, funny that you mentioned that, Judge Gertner, because I I uh, clerked many years ago for the late Judge Stephen Reinhardt of the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, who was married to my future boss, uh, Ramona Ripston, the longtime executive director of the ACLU of Southern California. Um, he had to recuse himself from many a case before the Ninth Circuit that the ACLU of Southern California was involved in. And I know it pained him greatly oftentimes to do so, but he did recuse himself. Um, so uh, there, there were a couple of questions about Justice Thomas and, and Supreme Court re recusal. Let me ask one of those. Um, after mentioning the issues regarding Justice Thomas and Ginny Thomas, which have received a lot of public attention in the last few months, um, the question is, do you think that binding ethical rules should be developed for the Supreme Court? I, I think there's no question. Um, the issue is how to enforce them, because it is the highest court. And if you had, uh, there was a concern that if there was a, a panel you know, adjudicating these ethical rules, that it would uh, undermine the independence of the Supreme Court. So there are suggestions. There could be a subcommittee of the existing court that could constitute themselves as a committee to review ethical issues. It's conceivable that there could be a, a panel of appeals court judges, senior appeals court judges to evaluate uh, ethical rules. Right now, we're in an anomalous situation. The anomalous situation is there is no enforceable code of ethics, and, and therefore, the only way of enforcing these rules is impeachment. And that's an absurd situation. I, I should say, I don't fault Ginny Thomas for having her own political views. We could hardly, I mean, as a feminist, I could hardly say that. There are two issues here. One are, uh, is the, uh, the subpoena case in which the court was dealing with the subpoena of records, which included her texts. That's very close. And the other is her role in funding amicus briefs that go before the Supreme Court. I don't, I don't care about their pillow talk. You know, um, uh, although I would hope that they don't talk about pending cases. Um, but there's a, a line that has been crossed with, in this case which really every judge, whatever your, whoever appointed you has to be discomfited by, because I surely am. So um, you touched on impeachment and, and one, one viewer listener has a question about that. Um, what do you think about lowering the standard for impeachment? I guess I'm not sure exactly what the standard 
for impeachment is other than what's set forth in the constitution, which is not terribly specific, but putting that aside, what about lowering the standard of impeachment of a justice given that that is the main means, um, maybe the only means currently by which we can enforce any ethical or other rules that apply to Supreme Court justices? Um, I think that there's dangers to that. There's dangers to that, which is the dangers of judicial independence. I don't like your decision. I'm therefore going to move uh, to impeach you. That's why I'm, I, I want to make it clear that I don't like their decisions, but that's really not what was motivating the changes I was, I was suggesting. Um, I think that an enforceable code of ethics is what you need with fines and a court of enforceable recusal uh, mechanism, um, figuring out what, in, what enforcement would look like. That makes that makes sense. Um, it doesn't make sense to have district court judges with far less power and court of appeals judges with far less power than the court of appeals have these, this detailed code that we have to follow uh, and the highest court with this unbelievable amount of power, not. Um, so I think impeachment is, is, is sort of a thermonuclear device for the problem and, and runs into more serious issues. Uh, some kind of enforcement panel, either as a subcommittee of the court or as a subcommittee of the appeals courts, uh, is a better alternative. You know, we can look to what other countries have done. We're not unique. And other countries have an enforcement mechanism that is not, in, you know, that is not nuclear war. And we have to look to that. Our, our court, I mean, I, I think I've said this now, when, we be, when the commission began to look at other countries, it was clear that the US Supreme Court was unique and not good, uniquely good in numbers of ways. Other courts were larger, other courts had enforceable codes, other courts you know, had, uh, didn't have anything like a shadow docket, had clear rules for when you accept cases and when you don't, um, had a confirmation process that was more rational than ours. Um, it, it, it really goes back to Professor Braver's question about precedent. Just because we've been doing it this way for how many years doesn't mean that the current situation hasn't exposed flaws in the process that we never saw before. And I think it has. So um, uh, you just mentioned the shadow docket. I, I wonder if you might just remind our viewers and listeners what you're referring to by that, since I, I suspect some people who are uh, paying attention here might uh, might know more about it than others. And then there's a question uh, from one of our colleagues, Professor Whitford, what limitations on the use of the shadow docket would you like to see? Well, um, that's an interesting question. I mean, the shadow docket refers to cases that the court decides without an opinion and without briefing. Um, it could be, you know, I just want to analogize to when I was on the, on the court, there were certainly decisions you could make, which um, uh, were procedural decisions, uh, which were, uh, that didn't raise, you know, intergalactic constitutional issues um, uh, that were really ministerial. Um, it should not be used to, in my view, it shouldn't be used for executions. It shouldn't be used to adjudicate issues that clearly raise deep constitutional questions, controversial, you know, constitutional questions. Um, what happens is you have an unsigned order from the court without briefing, uh, uh, and it would be one thing if it didn't matter. If it were, it's not precedential. Uh, but it certainly affects rights of people who have appealed. It affects rights. And it's done without an examination of the, of the issues. It has grown uh, over the years. Um, uh, sometimes it's a place where the court has used, um, where, where essentially you want to put decisions, opinions that you, you knew the court would be divided, so it was better to resolve them in this sort of back-channel way. But the highest constitutional court of the country should not do it that way. So um, I, again, I, I think we could, I, I haven't really thought carefully about what could be in it, but off the top of my head, there, there clearly are procedural, ministerial kinds of decisions um, that 
do not engender the same kind of division that you see with major constitutional cases, that would make sense. It was not only the shadow docket, I might add, under the Trump administration and recently, there have been numbers of cases that have skipped the Court of Appeals. The court has enabled emergency gesture, emergency processes to go from the district court directly to the Supreme Court so that the usual fleshing out of issues that you see when a district court judge does X, the Court of Appeals does Y, the Supreme Court does whatever it does, we haven't had that. And that only enhances the power of this court, which is extraordinary. Yeah. Um, well, one of the areas in which the Supreme Court so-called shadow docket has been especially active is uh, the area of election law and voting rights, where the court has repeatedly reversed, sometimes with very brief opinions or orders, uh, injunctions against practices alleged to vote violate voting rights. And you alluded to voting rights uh, earlier in your, in, your, in your dialogue with Professor Braver as one of those areas in which you see the Supreme Court's recent rulings is especially damaging. So uh, here's, a, here's another question on this subject. Recent Supreme Court decisions seem to be seriously undermining concepts of small d democracy. Um, what long-term effects do you think this will have on our body politic? And is there anything that can be done about that? You know, I, I, um, I agree with the premise of the question. Um, Professor Klarman at, Har at Harvard talks about this as the degradation uh, of American democracy. And, and that figures into my understanding of why this is a break the glass moment. Um, it, I mean, I think the only thing that can be done is through the electoral process, since the courts have shut off, uh, you know, has have enabled changes, which both changes in the South to, uh, you know, clearly voter suppression cases, the way they've sort of allowed that to happen, um, uh, allowed extraordinary gerrymandering. Um, unfortunately, it's, it, it's a, I'm not sure I have a happy answer here because the only way to change this is, is, is through elections, but it has to then be elections that nevertheless can be won by people notwithstanding these changes. And, and, uh, and that will take more, you know, much more work. Um, the, the, is, was it the, was it the uh, Georgia case that you were talking, there's a Georgia case where the district court uh, threw out the redistricting uh, and the court took, you know, the court essentially using the shadow docket just reversed them. Now, that's a classic example of the problems of the shadow docket. The content of our democracy, the rules that we follow are terribly important and need to be debated in, you know, in full view of the country. So that's exactly the kind of case that should not be resolved through the shadow docket. But given this Supreme Court and given the restrictions on that the, the same candidate that the Republicans have enacted um, uh, on elections, the only way to change now is, uh, uh, you know, a massive electoral movement to win notwithstanding those changes. So, um, Here's a question on the role of lawyers in the process. Um, we seem to be totally ignoring the ostensible meaningful actors in the court, the lawyers. Do we not trust the lawyers to influence, persuade the justices to make proper rulings? Are we basically saying that the advocacy, advocacy skills of lawyers don't matter in the Supreme Court in many cases? That's a great question. Um, if you believe as I do that, that this is, I think the short answer is they don't matter. I think the short, in some cases, let me put it that way, because there are at least three new justices who have their own very clear view of the law. They are taking the cases to reflect their view of the law, to enact their view of the law, they are writing opinions to enact that view of the law. So do I believe that a persuasive advocate can convince Justice Gorsuch not to 
you know, defang OSHA uh, uh, with in the in the case involving the vaccine mandates? Do I believe that the fabulous advocates who could can persuade him? No. No, I do not. But I'm being honest. So I, you've been really incredibly patient and uh, also uh, admirably concise in your responses to these questions, Judge. So I just have a few more for you. We've got a we've thank you to everyone out there who's put in such good questions. I'm sorry that we're not going to be able to get to them all, but let, let me go with just a couple more before we conclude here. Um, I'm going to actually ask a two of them here uh, in, in sequence, both of which have to do with the relationship between the Supreme Court and other public institutions. Uh, first question, how do you foresee the current Supreme Court affecting the growing tension between state governments and the federal government? For example, I live in California and there's increased talk of California simply refusing to recognize the U.S. Supreme Court precedent or decisions to protect human rights that may be stripped as the Supreme Court overturns its own precedents. And then second question, um, uh, the court seems to be so far out of step with basic principles. Shouldn't the president simply declare court decisions unconstitutional and refuse to allow those decisions to be enforced? The president, if he's acting in a constitutional democracy, can't. If the court's interpretation of the constitution, the president can't overrule that. Um, uh, in some instances, the Supreme Court's interpretation of a statute can be overruled by, uh, the, by Congress. The Lilly Ledbetter law was a classic example of that, where the uh, court ruled that Ledbetter had um, filed her case late because she didn't realize that her pay had been affected by discrimination over a period of time. The, the Congress changed the law to make her filing and like filings rather timely. So Congress can overturn a legislative interpretation. Congress can't really overturn a constitutional interpretation. We can amend the constitution, but as I said, we have a notoriously difficult amending uh, process. The states versus federal, that's a very interesting question. State courts are incredibly important now. Um, uh, in Massachusetts, my, my husband and I, that very same ACLU person, before I went on the bench, we were responsible for bringing the case that enshrined the right to choose abortion under the Massachusetts Constitution. And I think you'll see more and more of that uh, in state constitutional courts around the country. They can only go so far. They are bounded by their own uh, state constitutions. Uh, state legislation that arguably offends the federal constitution will wind up before the Supreme Court, but there's much that can be done at the state level. And, and, um, and that's where I think I, I encourage my students who, you know, want, everyone wants to clerk for a federal judge, and I encourage my students to start clerking for state constitutional courts, uh, because I think that that's where the action is. Every state has its own Constitution and in Massachusetts, our Constitution predated the federal Constitution. So we 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 declared that the, the, the federal state judicial court, Supreme Judicial Court, declared the death penalty unconstitutional. Enshrined abortion has different rules with respect to search and seizure. Um, uh, that's where the action is, and that's where it needs to be. I might add, um, abortion is a little complicated. If tomorrow. Uh, the Supreme Court announces that the fetus is a human being under the federal constitution, that will invalidate um, state constitutional protections for abortion. So um, there's nothing in the existing cases that suggests they will do that. That would be such a leap. And apropos of your question a few moments ago, in my personal judgment, that would be political with a capital P as opposed to a small P. I'm gonna close with some questions that um, 
uh, will allow you to talk about your forthcoming book. Uh, one was the title, and I believe I can answer that one, Incomplete Sentences. Uh, when is it expected out? And um, why weren't you the facts that you learned in these subsequent conversations in front of you at the time of sentencing? Is this a failing of the pre-sentence reports or are the sentencing factors under a 3553 somehow inadequate? Um, that's a, that, I teach a course in sentencing. That's about, that'll take about, a, I would say, five months, uh, the latter part of that. Pa part of it is there was a major institutional change in sentencing in the 1980s federal sentencing guidelines, federal mandatory minimums. And even, and, and the, the change in sentencing had an impact on judges, prosecutors, and lawyers. So that even when the guidelines were no longer mandatory, they have been followed. So yes, lawyers did not raise issues to me that they should have because there wasn't a box for it under the federal sentencing guidelines. Um, and, and I tried to look at other issues, um, but if they were not raised for me, if they were not teed up, there was not much I could do. Give you an example of, um, I remember reading a pre-sentence report to sentence a woman, um, and it seemed clear to me because I had uh, litigated these kinds of cases that um, there was at least the possibility that she was being abused by the leader of the group, this drug conspiracy, that there was domestic violence involved. The lawyer didn't raise it because there was no box under the guidelines for domestic violence. There was no, you couldn't fit in, it was a square peg in a round hole. Um, I said, I don't care, I wanna know. And sure enough, when it was, when there was a subsequent investigation, it was clear that that was true and there was a ground to depart, but the lawyer didn't raise it because it seemed like an uphill uh, fight. So um, uh, that's a whole other discussion that really changed judging because most of the time judges would only look at the boxes and not look beyond that. Um, and it changed lawyering. Um, but uh, much of what I've learned, uh, uh, you know, I, uh, much, of, much of what I've learned is incredibly troubling. Uh, Re-entry conditions that I imposed that I thought I was being fabulous, you know, some fabulous, uh, uh, mental health treatment and, you know, uh, vocational counseling. Guy gets out of prison and he's homeless. He's homeless. And what happened was that the conditions that I imposed at the beginning of his sentence, in fact, were effectively tripwires that he couldn't possibly accomplish given the resources that were available to him. And I had no idea. I thought it was fabulous and I was wrong. Um, you know, one, one man, I, I uh, uh, violated the terms of his release. Um, he got kicked out of a halfway house. We couldn't envision, there was no place that would take him. Fell in, kicked out of a halfway house. In, in now researching his case, fact, there were family members we could have found. We could have tried to prevail on them. We could have done more. It didn't make sense that the alternatives I, I, seen, I thought I was given was back in prison versus something else. I wished I had used my power to find the something else. And, uh, and I didn't. Too often I say, judges will say and lawyers will say they have no choice, but there's always choice. There's always more you can do. So when will this book come out? Uh, I'm, uh, I'm in my seventh chapter. I rewrote it. I mean, my seventh rewriting of it. I rewrote parts of it after the Black Lives Matter movement because I wanted to make sure that I had not written a book that was about my, what a savior I was and that I would come to grips with my own uh, uh, bias. Um, so um, my hope is in a year. Watch for incomplete sentences, soon to be a major motion picture. <laughs> we can't wait. Um, well, thank you, Judge Gardner. I do want to mention something related to the previous question on um, you know, friction that the Supreme Court's decisions are causing with states and state courts and state constitutions. Um, it's a major subject here at the University of Wisconsin Law School. We've recently started a state democracy research initiative 
uh, led by professors Miriam Seifter and Rob Yablon. Uh, that project, the State Democracy Research Initiative, will be hosting a conference very soon on May 19th and 20th, a little less than a month away, um, on interpretation in the states where we'll have several prominent state Supreme Court justices participating. Uh, I'm gonna put a link in the chat right now for everyone and would strongly encourage you to join that conference if you have an interest in that subject. Uh, I have a couple more things to say before we go, but I do want to make sure to, to turn to Associate Dean Ginny Josty uh, for uh, information on those who are seeking CLE credit for this to let people know how they can get that credit. Ginny? Good afternoon. Thank you so much to everyone who could be here today. So I'm putting a link into the chat right now, which is a Google form. Um, all I need you to do is complete the form and list the passcode for this event so you can get credit for your attendance. The passcode is amicus, A-M-I-C-U-S, amicus. So if you could just make sure to fill out that form, it, the link will be live till 8, 8 p.m. tonight. If you, I'll put an email in the chat as well, if you have any problems connecting or have questions regarding your CLE portion. Thank you, uh, Associate Dean Josty. I wanna thank you as well as the external affairs team that you lead, including Kim Rather, Justine Seleski, and Aaron Hart uh, for your expert work in putting together the Fairchild Lecture as well as all the events that we do here at the law school, public events that we do here at the law school. Um, I, I do wanna offer my sincere thanks on behalf of everyone here to Judge Gertner, as well as Professor Josh Braver for this fascinating discussion. Uh, we do really appreciate it. And you've given us a lot of things to think about that I think it's fair to say are of existential importance for the future of our constitutional democracy. Before we part ways, um, I, I have something to do. Usually we'd be doing this live, but a tradition here at the University of Wisconsin Law School, Judge, for our distinguished speakers who are kind enough to join us is the presentation of the gargoyle. Here it is. Um, <laughs> um, so um, this, is, this is a replica of a gargoyle, actually two gargoyles that used to grace the old law school building here on beautiful Bascom Hill in Madison for some 70 years before our old building was torn down in the 1960s. So uh, I said there were two, there's one of them that sits in the lobby, uh, the law school's atrium for all to see that was uh, preserved by my predecessor as Dean George Young. Another was thought to be lost until relatively relatively recently, when a couple of years ago, um, one of these uh, sandstone gargoyles was found in a backyard and it turned out that it was discovered that it had been recovered by one of our alumni and had traveled around the country to Virginia and then back here to Wisconsin. It now sits in the corner of my office <laughs> over there. Um, anyways, the, the gargoyle is the symbol of the University of Wisconsin Law School. It's an embodiment of the commitment to the values that this law school represents, including the advancement of knowledge and the promotion of equal justice under law, both of which you have in an extraordinary way exemplified throughout your career and during our lecture today. So it's my pleasure to virtually present you with this gargoyle. Um, one will be sent in the mail to you and it will Make sure to put plenty of postage on it, Judge, because it's pretty heavy. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're extraordinarily grateful for your participating. And we hope that you can come visit us in Madison sometime very soon. I very much want to. Thank you. 
thank you so much. I very much want to be there and mingle and talk and talk to your students and talk some more about this. I think these are critical issues. We'll look forward to that. And thank you so, as well so much, Professor Braver. Thank, thank you, it was wonderful. Thank you, Judge Gartner, and thank you, Dean, Dean Zubadi. Okay. Well, we appreciate as well all of you tuning in for this, and we will catch you next time, and hopefully next time we can all gather in person. Take care, everyone, and thanks for being part of today's Fairchild Lecture. Thank you.